Hi, I'm William Barkas, and I'm going to be taking you through the paper Detecting Intrusions in Cyber-Physical Systems of Smart Cities, Challenges and Directions. The paper was written by two authors, Ismail Boutin and Patrick Osterberg, um, from the Department of Information Systems and Technology at Mid-Sweden University in Sweden. And the paper was actually published as a book chapter in a book called Secure Cyber-Physical Systems for Smart Cities, published in 2019. Quickly about the book, um, it's sort of a, a broad reference on information security and privacy in smart cities settings, and uh, you know covers a, a pretty broad range of topics. It looks like from the the table of contents, this is the only ar article actually read. Here's a quick background on the first author of the paper, Ismail Boutoun. Um, I'll I'll let you read that uh, to keep, save time. And Patrick Osterberg, who was the second author, and I think this work was done out of his lab, and he's the head of the Department of Information Systems and Technology uh, at the Mid-Sweden University. So the paper, uh, here's the abstract. Um, it's essentially about <clears throat> the interface of smart cities with cyber physical systems and how the cyber infrastructure kind of underlying smart cities introduces a number of security vulnerabilities um, that, that leads to a number of severe problems, such as system failures, privacy violations, issues of data integrity, um, all, all of, of course, if security and privacy are not addressed properly. Um, in their point of view, they're actually making a case that to do cyber-physical system security correctly in smart cities, we need, they need to use uh, advanced um, anomaly detection approaches. And so they spend quite a bit of time covering these various anomaly detection or intrusion detection systems, IDS, that they talk about, which we'll get into shortly. So an introduction, what are smart cities? What are cyber-physical cyber systems? Uh, the authors kind of back into the, the, the topic area without defining it too tightly, but you know they look at cyber cities, cyber infrastructures, cyber facilities, broad categories like Internet of Things, Industrial Internet of Things, IIoT, Web of Things, um, Internet of Everything. And uh, these are a few areas which are namely related to the current work, uh, current topic of smart cities. And cyber versions of these things are, quote, the counterparts of the terms they emphasize, such as cities, infrastructures, facilities, and relate to the smarter, automated, and technologically improved versions of them. Uh, and then they go on to say that, you know, cyber physical systems are one of the main pillars of all cyber related notions, such as cyber cities, cyber infrastructures, and cyber facilities. But what are smart cities and why do we care? So broadly speaking, there, you know, there's some big changes in the world and that's not just the view from Silicon Valley of the, of the sort of tech innovation giants. The world population living in cities is predicted to double by the United Nations by 2050. Um, this is 2.5 billion more human beings roughly and you know, they all have needs for services and access to opportunity. At the same time, the world's climate is changing. So how do we want to live in that world? Um, and smart cities are part of the answer, at least. So how do you define smart cities? This is a quote from San Francisco's mayor, former mayor Ed Lee, uh, that smart cities are a locally defined idea with common features, including resident-centric services, focus on problems based on community needs and priorities, data-driven processes, and sensors and connectivity. Um, which I think does a good job of summarizing how most people look at smart cities now. It's not exactly, it initially started as a sort of vendor marketing term, um, but has become really a, a sort of an algebraic placeholder for the strategy and vision that any, each given city has. So it's a, a really a locally defined idea. For instance, in San Francisco, this is just one of many kind of smart cities uh, solutions being being tried out. Uh, they're They're interested in earthquake preparedness, clearly. So one thing they're trying is a pilot where the doors of the, of the fire stations open automatically upon detection of a seismic event um, of relevant size. And because the doors are electric and if the power is out, they won't be able to get the fire trucks out. Um, another vision of Smart City is uh, NVIDIA's, which is around you know, the AI city and looking at uh, data from cameras. But broadly speaking, Smart City's domains kind of cover a number of areas. So government services, um, mobility and logistics, how you get people and goods around, uh, utility systems, energy, water, food, waste, the built environment, um, including you know, the buildings we live and work in, uh, 
environmental sensors or sensing, including air pollution, water sensors, more, and public safety and emergency preparedness. Some example use cases of smart cities are you know, intelligent street lighting, waste management, energy management, environmental monitoring, parking, traffic control, advertising monitoring, asset management, predictive maintenance. And so, so that's a giving, I think, a good sense of what the broad vision of the smart city is and why we care and how, how many different cyber physical systems clearly underlie that vision. So here's the authors of the book, of uh, this uh, paper, sorry, just describing what cyber physical systems means. And uh, they say cyber physical systems in general are interrelated to the Internet of Things, and in specific cases, the industrial Internet of Things, in which CPS utilizes IoT and IIoT to command and control several tasks related to the automation of real world duties, such as in the process of control of sewer drainage, drainage systems, water treatment facilities, etc. So, therefore, in our text, CPS has been thought of as an upper umbrella to represent both IoT and IIoT. Whereas Internet of Everything, which was mentioned earlier, um, kind of in includes people and some other things, is, is sort of out of the scope of, of the, their definition. So clearly, cyber physical systems in this context provide extra security risks. They, they consist of you know, a number of subnetworks and therefore possess all the security, security vulnerabilities that these subnetworks might have. So in securing a cyber physical system, all the subsystems need to be considered. That means advanced monitoring procedures need to be devised to detect and identify you know, malfunctioning of network components or corruption and measurements caused by intruders. And especially as you look at robust and resilient power systems and smart grid systems, um, more advanced security needs to be developed. We cited the paper here from 2011. Finally, in their opinion, um, security functions, especially intrusion detection systems, IDS, are one of the most powerful tools to provide that. So figure one, here's the life cycle of information security, which consists of three parts. Um, first, prevention, second, detection, and third, mitigation. As you can see uh, in this figure two, kind of a representing the schematic of uh, the industrial Internet of Things or, or Industry 4.0 in the context of a smart factory, um, that smart cities will constitute a number of critical infrastructures, nuclear power plants, water treatment facilities, and therefore are significant targets for cyber attackers. And um, cyber physical systems are kind of one of the, the broader point of, points of failure uh, or points of vulnerability for cyber attackers. And finally, there, you know, given the, the importance of that, <clears throat> When an intrusion happens for a cyber physical system in a smart city context, it needs to be detected quickly to prevent further serious damage or loss. And uh, just to, you know, state it in the author's words, the importance of cybersecurity in this context, you know, the cyber physical systems of smart cities may include critical infrastructures such as water treatment facilities, electric power turbines, public transportation systems, smart buildings, etc. Cybersecurity of such infrastructures has prime importance since failure of these systems may threaten property or, more importantly, human lives. And the authors give the example of the Stuxnet virus, which I'm sure is pretty familiar to, to many of you listening. Uh, this was the 2011 attack on Iranian nuclear enrichment facilities, and it was devised to be active at a Siemens Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, SCADA system. Uh, the infiltration happened through some Windows installed computers with internet connections. And the SCADA systems are responsible for controlling the turn speed of the centrifuges that were used in uranium enrichment. The Stuxnet virus caused the centrifuges to spin out of control, resulting in explosions uh, with loss of property and potential human, potentially human life. Uh, their, their key takeaway from that incident was that lack of cybersecurity measures and critical infrastructure can lead to harmful attacks with serious consequence to property, human life, and industrial espionage. Their general thesis uh, is that intrusion detection systems are essential for CBS security in smart cities. Um, they make the point you know, that no matter how advanced the security in a network is, there's some chance that malicious actors will exploit vulnerabilities at some point. And IDS reveals unauthorized access to our systems from within or outside our network. And essentially it does three things. It spots, identifies, and reports intrusions. And they, they kind of make the claim that IDS, quote, can be called the, the main pillar of cyber defense. So then they spend the most, the rest of the paper really looking at 
IDS systems and, the, and a lot of time on how IDS can be classified. So there are three broad categories, um, systems that use source of audit data, systems that use different detection, or you can classify based on detection methodology, or based on honeypot systems used as IDS agents. So looking at the first of those, um, IDS classification based on the source of audit data, they break that into three categories. So there's host-based IDS, um, using, which essentially works on the hosting computer system, computer or system of collecting evidence and providing alerts in the case of a triggering event. Um, so the evidence, therefore, is generally related to that host. Um, it's like what processes or services we're running, things like that, the specific system and function calls. Second, there's a category of network-based IDS that work on a partition of the network, um, usually on a router or a switch. They monitor and analyze the content of the packets flowing through the network and the upper layers of the uh, Open Systems Interconnect protocol, um, protocol stack, rather, to detect suspicious and unusual activity. Finally, a hybrid IDS system merges both of those into a unified and centralized manner, um, and th they're actually going to claim later that that's the best system for a smart city CPS. So looking at the second of the two broad breakdowns, IDS classifications based on detection methodology, these can also be broken down into three, three different subcategories. So uh, this paper was written by oops. Uh, all these people whose name I'm not going to pronounce. Um, there's actually a link to Hold the presentation. On. I'm pause this. That... So as I was saying, the uh, second classifications based on detection methodology can also be broken down in three categories. Um, first is anomaly detection based IDS, uh, second misuse detection based IDS, and third specification detection based IDS. So conventional anomaly detection um, looks at, it can be looked at, there are three different kind of ways to go about that, I know there's a lot of threes, but um, turns out there's, so there's three categories, statistical, data mining, and artificial intelligence based methods. They're going to, looking at figure three of the paper, they show a taxonomy of how they break these down, and so we're, I'll talk briefly about each of these sections. Um, so you don't need to spend too too much time looking at this chart here, but you can refer back to this. Um, so the first set, the statistical detection models use three broad areas, three broad ways, univariate statistical detection, um, which are, in which case, all the parameters related to detection are modeled as independent Gaussian uh, random variables. Multivariate, multivariate statistical detection where two or more metrics are correlated and evaluated to obtain you know, conclusions about intrusions. Finally, time series statistical detection, uh, where they have event counters record inter-arrival times and event happenings to be further analyzed. And um, this can look across multiple types of events. The second type of anomaly, of conventional anomaly detection, data mining. These can be expert systems, um, which are you know, devised to manage complex problems, uh, looking at a variety of knowledge, represented mostly as if-then rules rather than legacy procedural code. Um, in this detection model, audit data is classified according to predefined rules to be solved by reasoning approaches. Second, de description language in the detection. Mo this detection model, based on some data specifications, um, unified modeling language diagrams are generated with the, the, to help with the detec detection methodology. Finally, or it's not finally, thirdly, finite state machines, um, which can switch from one state to another to transition based on some external stimulants, and the change of a state is referred to as a transition. Uh, so the FSM is declared by a list of its states, uh, its initial state, and then the terms for each transition. In this model, based on available data sets, states and transitions related to FSM are generated, and some of the states and state transitions are expected to help with catching intrusions. Finally, data clustering and outlier detection, uh, kind of clear, look, looking at different, you know, clustering the data, clustering data to see uh, based on pre predefined ideas, I guess, of, to look for predefined similarity or distances from each other, and that, you know, events outside a certain range are, are considered outliers. Finally, conventional anomaly detection using AI. There's actually eight different sort of sub-techniques here. So using Bayesian networks, it's a form of probability theory. Um, so Bayes' theorem is described as the probability of an event based on prior knowledge of conditions, which would be related to that, related to that event. Um, hidden Markov models, 
using stochastic Markov theory to employ, to create states that are interrelated with some transition probabilities. Uh, in this model, the topology of the network, as well as the capabilities of the overall ideas can be modeled and observed. Fuzzy logic, uh, where Boolean logic has truth values of variables which are represented by, including by zero or one, but in contrast, fuzzy logic uses a sort of multi-valued logic and with truth values can be any real number between zero and one. And it is employed to handle the concept of partial truth or partial falsity, uh, where the truth value may range between completely true and completely false. And this um, can help with uncertainty and approximation to evaluate event conditions, which are either intrusions or not. Genetic algorithms. Um, so the genetic algorithms are a meta heuristic inspired by natural selection. Um, the, uh, Darwinian national selection that belongs to a larger class of evolutionary algorithms. They are commonly employed to obtain high quality solutions for search and optimization problems and use bio-inspired operators such as mutation, crossover, and selection. Um, artificial neural networks. Um, this is becoming more, more and more common. Using neural networks um, kind of influenced the mathematicians uh, to solve complicated problems. I mean, this is this is AI as we talk about it all the time. Um, and here they use some specific data sets to construct and train the neural networks and use that to do to do classification and detection. Principal component analysis, PCA. Um, this is a statistical procedure to convert a set of observations of correlated variables into a set of values. Um, of linear, linearly uncorrelated valuables called principal components by deploying an orthogonal transformation, essentially looking for the highest variance um, of, of, the, of the value. And uh, these can, this can, is a dimensionality reduction technique that can be used to look at intrusions. Um, it comes up with things you wouldn't think about as uh, kind of human preconditions or human uh, preconceived ideas of what you might find. Um, PCA does a good job of getting around those. Support vector machines in this detection model, supervised learning models called SVM, um, are associated with learning algorithms that analyze network traffic and are used for classification and regression analysis. Extreme learning machines in this detection model, feed forward neural networks are used for classification, regression, clustering, sparse approximation, compression, and feature learning the attack vectors towards a system or network with a single layer or multiple layers of hidden nodes. And the parameter of the hidden nodes need not be tuned. So there's some classification based on mi misuse detection based IDS, um, where the interval rule, um, inter inter arrival times of consecutive messages must be below some certain threshold, retransmission rule, so nodes should work cooperatively together to retransmit message on the route, integrity rule, the integrity of the original message should be verifiable at the receiver, the delay rule, if a message delays a certain amount, then that needs to be retransmitted by the source, repetition rule, so retransmissions are allowed up to a certain number, Radio transmission range, messages from outsiders should be detected, and a jamming rule, there should be a maximum threshold to define normal packet collision rates. System diagnosis methods for IDS. Um, these uh, are a few different categories. There's file integrity checking, one of the strongest tools of IDS to look at unauthorized modifications of critical system files, as well as data files. There's network scanning, uh, examining the, the programs examine critical network services, systems and services for configuration errors and vulnerabilities. Um, network sniffing, so these tools capture network traffic and, and look at what what's in the traffic. Um, log, log analysis, so collecting and analyzing diagnostic status information from the network so devices and servers. It's probably the most important concept in IDS and recovery. Um, without the help of logging, the only way to learn what the problem is to see it is to see it while it's happening or to observe its consequences afterward. And there are two analysis methods for logging, manual and automated. Data resources for detecting, uh, for detection sensors. So there's access to registry, which is creating log for, logs for accessing registry records in a Windows operating system, integrity checks of the files, uh, log file records, um, system call traces. So there are Broadly speaking, four different types of anomaly decisions um, based on these probability distributions of normal and abnormal activity. So what you see on the left is abnormal activity under the red curve and on the towards the right, um, normal activity. And the vertical axis, the, the y-axis is the probability of, of seeing that, that activity. 
So there's um, true positives, which are you know intrusion activities that were declared truly declared as abnormal. That's what you want to see. True negatives, where normal user activities um, are declared as normal, but um, and I, and IDS should not trigger the alert. Um, false positives, which are where there's actually normal user activities falsely declared as abnormal, so it's just a bad performance indicator for an IDS. Uh, since it's essentially typical behavior is declared as or typical users are declared as intruders. And finally, false negatives, which are the intrusion activities falsely declared as normal. It's also a dangerous situation since um, intruders can look like uh, normal users. So the another suggestion that the authors make uh, is to use this, uh, a system called honeypots or honeypot systems, um, which are decoy systems that are designed to fool intruders into thinking they're attacking the real system. And this is an IDS in the sense that you can then uh, see what the intruders are doing, uh, even though they're not attacking the actual system, but are attacking your, your decoy. Um, so there are two types. There's low interaction honeypots that simulate only a few of the services frequently visited by attackers or frequently requested by attackers, um, so they don't demand as many resources, and their virtual systems can be efficiently employed for this purpose. And then there are high interaction honeypots, which are imitating the functionalities of regular systems and host a number of services. Attackers spend and waste their valuable time exploring these services, and um, as mentioned above, multiple honeypots can be hosted on a single physical machine, but you can, yeah, and you can do the, the low interaction ones on um, virtual systems. So they're quite expensive is, is their main downside, but they're higher, they're better, more, they're more secure. And here's a, a schematic, figure five, of how you might implement honeypots um, within a system behind some gateways, um, kind of, more external to the network and more internal to the network in one case. So the broad conclusions of the authors are that CPS or cyber physical systems of smart cities are mostly considered critical infrastructure and therefore need to be protected by all means. Uh, and that in their opinion, uh, intrusion detection systems are essential to securing cyber, cyber physical systems of smart cities. Hybrid IDS, which is host-based and network-based, in their opinion is the best option for intrusion detection they think that you know rapid response is essential or important for critical infrastructure, and in the future, uh, AI-based uh, intrusion detection system algorithms might be a good defense against insider attacks. Thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing your comments, questions.